welcome to the podcast where together, every Monday, we explore hospitality in its very broader sense. From culture and cooking, cocktails and coffee, nutrition and farming, politics and animal welfare, organic and sustainability, family and business, entrepreneurship, and much, much more. Come and learn with me, Mark Cribb, about where our food and our drink comes from, and the businesses, and more importantly, the human beings that thrive on where we decide to spend our time and our money. Sign up to our weekly newsletter at humansofhospitality.co.uk and hit subscribe on your podcast player of choice. We're going big this week, and actually I don't mean a big podcast, but a big business. Chatting to Jonathan Neem, the chief executive of Shepherd Neem Brewers. With 320 pubs and pre-pandemic turnover of £150 million, they are bigger than the normal business that I chat to on this podcast. But I think they have a really interesting family history. Having been around for over 300 years and maintained family ownership, I think they qualify as having had a very inspiring independent hospitality adventure that I really think you will find very interesting. However, I do need to apologise about the quality of the recording audio. The conversation is great and I hope makes up for it, but we did have some tech challenges on the morning and ended up having to use some pretty rudimentary kit to have a conversation at all. Not the sort of thing I would normally share since I'm a big fan of good quality audio, but Jonathan is a very busy human and I was just very grateful to get the time to have a chat. So I hope you can listen through the challenges. In essence, imagine you're on a mobile phone call with someone and the reception is a bit iffy. You're probably pretty used to that. Topic wise, Jonathan is clearly well informed on all that is going on in and around the pub sector. We touch on navigating the pandemic and at least seeing some growth in the grocery and off-sale side of the business. The responsibility of taking over multi-generational family businesses, how to navigate out of the pandemic and how different that may be in London compared to a proper community pub. We touch on changing beer trends, sourcing hops, rents as both a tenant and a landlord, future support to enable the sector to bounce back, and even Brexit all crops up in our very wide-ranging chat. Now, I'm sure you'll learn a nugget or two, and I really hope you enjoy the conversation. As always, taking a few minutes to leave a review on your podcast player of choice would really help me out. If in return for all the stress of trying to rescue that shocking audio from this conversation, you can just take two minutes to hit the subscribe and leave a review button, then we'll call it quits and I will be super grateful. Okay, let's get over and meet Jonathan. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Cheers. Jonathan Neem, Chief Executive of the Shepherd Neem. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Hugely appreciated. Whereabouts in the world are you, Jonathan? Um, I'm at home in Faversham uh, in Kent, um, looking at a very rainy day here. It's a grim, miserable January day. <laughs> yeah, same here. To add to our woes uh, in the hospitality sector. So um, really excited to speak to you, Jonathan. You're, you're not the oldest human that I've had on the podcast, but you're definitely the oldest uh, business uh, in the podcast, dating back to 1698 and even beyond that, I believe. Uh, am I right in saying potentially not only the oldest brewery in the country, but the oldest manufacturing site in the country? Is that right? Yeah, we believe so. I mean, the origin, we can prove continuous manufacturing back to 1573. Um, and uh, the origins of the business to go back to the Abbey in Faversham, where, you know, brewing agriculture and any number of things took place under the auspices of, of, of the church. That was established in 1147. At some stage, around the time of the, of the monasteries, uh, the brewing in the abbey transferred to our site using our water. So possibly 1550, possibly 1530, 1540, and continuous production ever since. So I think um, I'm not aware of any other manufacturing site that's been going for as long as that. Yeah, that's amazing. And have you, have you, when you say sort of continuous production, you've been able to continue producing in some way, even for the uh, for the off trade, presumably through the pandemic? Have you? We have, yes. Um, in fact, we were we were lucky or or, or sort of had good foresight, but we moved to a COVID-secure working environment and uh, uh, just for the employees uh, in the brewery uh, before the national lockdown and sort of introduced temperature checks and any number of other safety measures and workplace distancing. And that has enabled us to keep 
going through this. Um, you know, supermarket grocery sales have been good, and a number of our export customers have been able to keep going too. Okay, in sort of you know rough percentage terms, I suppose. How, how what's the drop? I guess it's if you just give people a sense of scale of numbers, because you've also got is it over three hundred pubs, quite a lot of hotel rooms. Can you just give people a sense of the sort of the size of the business? Because it's not just the brewery, is it? No, that's right. I mean, the bigger part of our business is we've got 320 pubs. We turned over about 150 million um, in the year running up to this crisis. Um, and, and of that, um, about three quarters of the turnover comes from our pub business. So losing the, host, losing, losing the pub business uh, has been uh, extremely challenging. Um, notwithstanding that, you know, the, the grocery trade has picked up. Um, so we were tracking at about 36% up in terms of volume um, through the, through uh, lockdown one. We're not quite at that level now, but we're still tracking above normal rates. Um, but it doesn't. It's very useful. Uh, keeps the brand out there. Keeps cash coming into the business. But it doesn't really compensate for the loss of our pub business. Yeah, no, absolutely. Good, good, good to have something running, I suppose. But uh, so normally, you know, this is this is called the Humans of the of Hospitality podcast. Generally, I tend to uh, speak to people from the sort of you know the independent, the smaller side of the sector. Where I was really inter- interested to speak to you is you sort of cross over because you're you're clearly uh, a very big business now. But there, there almost feels like there's an inevitability that you get big if you've been operating for over 300 years but you're also still you know your your name Jonathan Neem clues in the name I guess it is still very much a, a, as well as being listed it is still a family business is, is that right how many of the family are, are still involved and, and how many uh, of generations of your family have sort of been involved in the business um, it, well it is still very much a family business the family collectively um, still own um, over half the shares um, it's uh, it's a large family um, there are eight members of family in total in different roles, whether it's from a non role to you know full-time uh, leadership positions as myself. Um, there's a very strong family feel about the business too, and partly because of the origins that I said a minute ago, I, I think it's got the feel of a, of a strong community business. So it's not just the Neem family. There are a number of other families with the brewery uh, who have worked there for multiple generations uh, from Fabersham. So, you know, we're very unusual right in the town centre. Um, we, uh, I mean, I keep saying to people, no one in their right mind would build a brewery uh, in five acre town centre. These, That's what we are. Are, that's what we be. And we're still very true to our roots of focusing the majority of our business uh, on uh Kent and our local environment, using local hops, using local materials where we can, but I'm trying to sell our beers further afield through the national networks. So we've we, we've not really changed our business model uh, very greatly, um, but have continued to update and modernise our offer, you know, vigorously uh, during that time. Yeah. Okay. And, and with you know the the sort of family na- name, I imagine booking restaurants uh, around your local area with Jonathan Neem as your name. Well, did it feel inevitable? I know. I know you got involved in the business in 1991 when you, your your dad was in charge. Did it feel inevitable as a child that you would end up running that business, or did it come as a bit of surprise when you know that you're now in this role? Um, I don't think it's inevitable. I think it was certainly um, clearly a big feature of all of our lives, and I definitely wanted to have you know, a, a great interest in the business. But, you know, it's it's not an easy decision to get into a family business. Um, the industry is unrecognisable from the one that I joined in 1991. And therefore, you know, you need... Uh, you need the ability to adapt personally, but you also need the ability to 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 to, to adapt the business. Um, and there have been many battles and um, many, many challenges along the way. Um, so, no, I thought about it long and hard um, in my early 20s and half the time thought this is not right for me and the other half I thought I really want to do it. And I, I don't regret it at all, but um, uh, here we are 30 years on and uh, I'm uh, facing the biggest crisis uh, uh, probably in our history. Yeah, I was going to say it must feel uh, yeah like a particularly challenging tenure, I suppose, that you've got. I've spoken to other people who are sort of maybe multi generational farmers because quite often big farms get sort of passed down generation to generation, and I suppose that that they feels this sort of real sense of uh, responsibility to be the sort of current custodian of something that goes back multi generations. Is that is that something that weighs on your mind, and do you feel like you've been given a bit of a tough gig having this uh, pandemic to navigate through? 
Um, yes, to a certain extent. But I, but I look back at, for example, my great grandfather who took over the business literally in uh, January 1914 um, and um, stepped down uh, just after. Uh, the retreat from Dunkirk in 1941. He had a pretty tough ride too, um, and uh, but did a brilliant job to sort of see the business through. So, um, uh, you know, it is very challenging, this, this set of circumstances, but uh, I'm absolutely, resolutely determined that we will get through it, and we've done pretty well so far, but clearly we don't yet have an end um, to hang on to. Yeah, that, that's going to be challenging. So I'm going to come into sort of what support, I suppose, or, or how you see this panning out and where we go. But just before we do, um, if, you, if you think of the the sort of the pub sector, I, my sort of expertise, I guess, is more in the casual dining sector. And I'm sort of often have to remind myself of the issues we were facing pre-pandemic. And a lot of that was to do with, um, you know, oversupply in the market, maybe venture capitalists, growth of, of too many sort of chain restaurants and uh, recruitment of chefs. It was sort of tough times. Uh, but now we'll actually be grateful, I think, to go back to that. How were things looking in the pub sector over the last few years? What were the sort of key challenges? And do you, do you think those challenges are still going to be there once this is over? Yeah, well, um, clearly, we've got a very strong food business within our pubs. So some of those chef challenges were uh, very apparent to us. Uh, too. Um, I think we look back on the period of 2012 to 20 seems re- realistically as a, as, a, a, as a golden four years where there was volume growth, there was like-for-like growth, and uh, there was an awful lot of investment creativity. Um, since then, you know, consumer confidence became weaker um, w- w- post the Brexit vote, political uncertainty coming in, and getting that like-for-like growth had become harder and harder. But albeit we were investing heavily and had some good programmes. Um, so when we kind of shut up shop in uh, March of last year we were on track for a record year um, um, off the back of some pretty good investments that we made in the prior year um, so you know it was kind of hard yards but it seems like a walk in the park when one reflects back on it um, and some of those issues that were very apparent then for example the recruitment uh, of these de- de- decent chefs and staff um, has absolutely flipped on its head. And where we have recruited uh, in the summer of last year, you know, we've been absolutely inundated by applicant, high quality applicants too. Yeah. Okay. So there may be some uh, there, there may be some bonuses. Are you um are you have you had to close any sort of permanently close any pubs during this, or will they all be reopening at the end? Um, the, the majority will be reopening. I think we're cautious still about central London. Um, I don't quite buy the. The idea that nobody will go back to the office, um, but I think it will be a slow build in London. And some of our sites there are in locations where I think we are going to struggle uh, to see a quick bounce back. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think there will be some close there. I think in some of uh, our smaller communities, um, there might be some close, but it's not it's not game changing. I mean, we are a long-term, predominantly freehold food destination or character character pub type business. And so we're pretty confident that most of those outlets will come back. We've got great coastal sites, for example, and did spectacularly well last summer. So um, I think it's marginal, maybe a few percent of our outlets may not make it, um, but we expect the vast majority to do so. Okay, that's good. Um, being involved in the sector, you know, I've got a, a couple of restaurants, but also observing it. It feels like from a sort of consumer demand, I guess, as to where the, the beer, the brewery side of it, I guess, is going. Uh, it feels like we went on this swing journey, maybe, a, a, you know, away from traditional beers and very much into uh, lagers, often from multinationals. But perhaps now we're having a bit of a swing back, clearly a huge growth in kind of, you know, micro brewers, lots more sort of strong, hoppy beers around. What's what's your take on what's happening in the beer market? And, and how do you respond with, with so much sort of history in your business? Is it is it easy to sort of to flip and follow those sort of uh, changing consumer demands? Um, it's not that easy actually, and you know, ale traditional ale has been quite a weak market recently. Cask ale is now down to uh, about nine percent of the market, but actually, even when we reopened in the summer, uh, we were noticing quite a 
significant further shift towards cake lagers um, and fuller flavor beers. I think there's been an ongoing trend for some time towards drink less, drink better. And by drink better, it means fuller flavor. And I don't see that going away anytime soon. I think that um, people, particularly with table service, which of course came in as part of the COVID res restrictions, uh, when you're sitting down, you tend to have a slightly different experience than to stand at the bar and drink several pints of uh, relatively low ABV uh, ale. So people were sitting down and drinking slightly stronger, fuller flavored uh, products, but drinking less overall volume. Um, I mean, we can adapt to it. We've got a very flexible brewery. We're not all reliant on cask ale and traditional ales. We brew a lot of lager ourselves. We've brewed beers like Asahi and Kingfisher from India, um, and we've got Park Singer from Thailand, um, and we've got our own, own lager portfolio too. So we, we can compete. We can adapt. Some of the really sort of juicy IPAs and really full-flavoured craft beers um, is harder to do from a production point of view because it's quite small batch brewing, but undoubtedly something that we need to look at going forward. And also a shift in packaging type from cut from um, from uh, cask to keg, but also from bottle to can going forward. Um, so a lot of trends that we're building up in terms of taste and flavour pre-pandemic, I think will take a big step forward. I haven't talked about I would know, but I take a big step forward too, coming out the other side. Mm, okay. And then, you know, as well as the changing beers, I've got you, you've got people's changing demands on where they actually go to eat and drink. Although it, it feels that if you look at the casual dining sector, you, you have this sort of constant churn, I suppose, of new places being rolled out and then, uh, you know, perhaps be going under or, or being bought out. It feels like the pub sector, you know, everybody loves their local pub. They've got a bit of a, a sense of history. How do you find that sort of that that balance, I suppose, of yeah, yeah, making you know, keeping pubs relevant and, and wanting them to modernise them to the consumer, but also you know, do you think you do actually reap the benefit by not following the trends and, and not following what's going on elsewhere in the sector and actually staying as a proper British pub? Um, well, look, I mean, British pubs are, is a very broad church, as you know, and that a terrific investment in up in the last in the last few years. So I think a lot of pubs provide that perfect balance between authenticity and heritage, but also design, um, modern customer experience, um, good quality food, etc. Um, I, I think that perfect pub has got drinkers and it's got eaters, um, um, and it's got high standards of service and nice buzzy atmosphere. And particularly if there is a slight shift away from the office back towards community. Is a local business with, with deep roots, with authenticity, um, and possibly people working two days a week in in, uh, in urban areas, but spending their Mondays and Fridays in their in their, in their home environment. I think the local part could be entering a real golden age looking forward, and, and particularly those businesses, as I say, with strong local roots, uh, will be rewarded uh, if they've been seen to be good citizens um, in this pandemic, good community. Since I mean, um, and uh, hopefully we, we are that. So uh, I can think of any number of our pubs looking forward, which hit record sales in the summer, and I don't see why they can't go to a new level um, once this crisis has eased. Mm, okay, and when you say about pubs being sort of you know good community citizens and, and demonstrating that, what what sort of thing do you mean, and, and what have some of your places been doing? Well, I just look at my local pub here, the Three Mariners in Awe. I mean, Sarah's a bit of a community hero. She runs the village WhatsApp group. She looks after it, those that are uh, living on their own. She runs errands for people. She's got a grocery store uh, in a tent in the garden. She's been doing takeaways. She's been uh, collecting prescriptions for people. Um, she's running a village events, charities, um, any number of different things. So what I find most distressing about this crisis that there are parts of the health lobby that um, think that because she is a purveyor of alcohol that think of a villain to be controlled in the community whereas in this community the hero and a community hero uh, for looking after uh, the community and individuals and you know at its heart pubs are not about places for alcohol and, and drunkenness um, that's 
a myth that goes back for generations. Um, you know, pubs are about socializing, meeting, and it's a basic human phenomenon and a basic human need that the congregation face to face to meet. And in that context, I think that what we offer as a business has got as strong a future going forward as we've had in the past. Mm, yeah, I, I agree 100%. And I think you're right. I think that, you know, drink less, drink better. But but recognising that yeah, birthdays, anniversaries, business meetings, as you say, you know, the, the, the heart of the community. Do you think we've got an opportunity? Because it's been, it's been going on for many years that, that we've sort of been neglected, I guess, as an industry or, or it's felt that way. Um, but it's, the industry has really sort of stood tall and proud over the last uh, few months, you know, feeding kind of kids at local schools, I'm thinking of, and, and some of the citizenship stuff you mentioned. Do you think think there's an opportunity to convince the government now of our worth because um yeah it, it feels like we're getting really mixed messages i suppose with the initial support thinking of you know sort of furlough and eat out to help out but but of late it feels like much less what's your thoughts on the, the, the changing government perception of our sector well the most important audi- audience of all is consumer and i think the consumer has looked over the cliff uh, of potential of not having a pub in their community and have said, we want the pub, we love the pub, we believe it's important to us as individuals and important to us as a community. Um, and I think the great British public absolutely want us all to survive and, and, and we will survive. As government and particularly the health uh, lobby within the government are out of line with public opinion here. Um, in fairness, Sunak, I think he's done an excellent job and I trust the libertarian instinct of the Prime Minister and and m- many other MPs. But the, the sort of move towards uh, health authoritarianism is deeply uh, unattractive and needs to be uh, pushed back uh, very, very vigorously. But ultimately, the people that pay our way to keep our business going is the great British public. And if we go, um, Britain will be a very, very much poorer place uh, because of it. Mm, okay. And as well as the local community, you know, and the own, uh, the, the teams we employ ourselves, there's obviously a huge supply chain. I'm interested in sort of, you know, the, the, the level that you do things. And I think you know, one of the reasons the brewery is located where it is was because of the ability to sort of, you know, grow hops and the sunshine. Is, is a lot of your barley and hops and a lot of the stuff you buy, does that come in from, from sort of British farmers or with sort of flavour profiles and changes? Do you need to import a lot of hops anyway to sort of, you know, uh, meet expectations? Well, 80% of our barley is British barley. Um, 80% of our hops are grown within about 15 miles of the brewery. Um, but the rest are imported. And the reason for that is that the, 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 the archetypal British hop is Kent Golding. And it's m- m- grown near the brewery because there's a brick earth soil. And because of our sort of geography and topography, we've got well-drained soil we do get colder winters here because we're on a peninsula. We're quite exposed to the northeast winds uh, and um, get, tend to, to get a lot of uh, frost. But we also get very low rainfall and dry summers. Not today, I might say, but uh, <laughs> yeah. normally normally speaking. And that creates a particular flavour profile with the East Kent Golding. Now, in places like Wyoming and Utah and so on in the States, you get much more intense sunshine, which creates those very... Um, very strong uh, aromas that can get from US hop simply cannot get in the UK. So people that want hop forward uh, products, um, uh, you kind of need to have a blend of of, of British and US hops. But then still, for us, is Kentish hops. Mm, okay, excellent. That's good. Um, one of the other challenges before we come on, sort of specifically about the, the pandemic and future. So I, I can imagine you have over three hundred pubs. How do you manage the sort of the, the, the brand? I suppose I'm thinking of the complexity of. Are they all sort of very individual? I think I read somewhere that two hundred of these pubs were pre sort of seventeen hundreds or something like that. So you know, do you know if you've walked into a Shepherd Neem pub? Do you know is there some sort of consistency of brand across them apart from just the beer? I'm thinking the sort of the feel and the decor, or actually, do you work quite hard to keep them sort of all individual and people recognise them as as their local? Um, I, I hope you would get a, a, a sense of Japanese pub by um, by the welcome that you get um, by obviously the beer range, um, but um, but but what we really pride ourselves in is bringing out the individuality of those those outlets. Almost every one of our pubs has got unique characteristics or unique local 
patterns or unique history. And I've got an internal design team um, that are really, really good at, at bringing out all the nice features around the fireplaces and the gardens and and the terraces, etc. And uh, yeah, that's the key. The Shepardine brand, the swing sign, is if you like a stamp of quality. It's a it, it, it signpost to the type of welcome that you're going to get. But we positively, you know, move away or try try to be di- try to differentiate ourselves um, from uh, from from other types of mainstream offer. Um, and uh, bring out the the character and individuality of our brand. Okay, excellent. Um, moving sort of pandemic specific, and, and you've already mentioned that you're pretty, uh, but probably not you know lucky, but well placed in many ways because you own the freehold assets of so many of your buildings, and and a lot of the problem we're seeing in trying to navigate and, and come out the other side of this uh, is with regards to rent. So I suppose you, you know maybe the you're, you're slightly on the other foot. I don't know if you actually rent any of your buildings, but I presume you've got tenants that do. Have you got any thoughts on how we we solve this sort of problem? We've had this constant renewing of the of the sort of mon, uh, moratorium. Uh, kicking the can down the road. What's your experience? I'm interested with so many properties of your own. How do we get around this rent issue? Um, so we we rent about forty of our pubs. They're mainly in London, and um, we've got a, our own wide range of spectrum of landlord behaviour. We've got possibly five to ten percent of the landlords that have really dug in and said, you know, it is what it is. Do what you, you know, pay the rent, um, and that have been thoroughly sensible and uh, recognise the circumstances and given us various from, you know, 10% to 100%. So we've got a very active property department. We've got good relations. In my view, any landlord worth their salt is going to recognise that Shepherd Neem's a pretty decent company and that their interest, if we're there, um, when we can reopen, because otherwise we're going to have a vacant position get no rent at all. So I think landlords need to sort of, you know, wake up and think uh, what's in their best interest. So when we are the landlord in a situation, we've always believed that if we can hold our licensees, our independent tenants into in our pubs through the pandemic, um, they will be the ones that drive our recovery coming out the other side. So we've not charged any rent when while well, we've been closed and only, you know, half half rent or thereabouts during the periods that we have been open. And so far, we've only had a handful of licensees that have left the business since March of last year. And we've got people that are, you know, very keen to take pubs when we've got vacancies coming forward. Uh, you know, the tied pub system has been much criticised over the years, but I think it's really demonstrated um, uh, its worth in this um, scenario because most uh, brewer landlords have rec- that is crucially important to keep licenses in have been much more flexible than arm's length commercial landlords um, who've who've got no skin in the game except the need for rent. And uh, to my mind, the the model that has really shone through is not the free of the tie model, uh, but the tide model and flexibility and the partnership. Um, but yeah, going forward, there is going to be a contraction space. Landlords are going to take a hit. Balance sheets are going to take a hit. And those ones that, that have got a decent appreciation of what their um, what their tenants, lessees need to get them through this, uh, will they be the ones that recover faster, in my view. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? If your experience is, you know, sort of when you're you, you, the boot on the other foot, is that only five to ten percent of the landlords in London are actually engaging and negotiating. You know, if, if that's replicated across the industry, yet you know, I, I've got one landlord who's been fantastic and been very accommodating, and I've got another one who's in, insisting on a hundred percent rent. It, you know, if it is only five to ten percent that are behaving, we're clearly going to have a big issue. Do you think the government are going to need to step in? They seem very reluctant so far to put any kind of, uh, you know, a, apart from a code of conduct, no sort of. Stand- statutory obligation have you seen anything elsewhere in the world or do you, do you think they're going to need to get involved or do you think the reality is we're just going to have to see how it pans out and a, and a number of people won't get through i think it's really dangerous for governments to interfere in in um arm's length commercial contracts um uh of the of the landlord and tenant relationship it's a it's extremely complicated area 
and I'm not sure that we should be looking at law changes during a pandemic. I think the principle of grant money is the right way to deal with this, and grant money is meant to kind of put food on the table for licensees, but also contribute to their overheads. Now, the question for me is, is that grant money sufficient? Is it enough? Or to which I would say, no, it's not. So I think the response that I would prefer to see is that there's just higher levels of grant to, to, meet, to meet those overheads, including contributions towards rent, rather than trying to interfere in the relationship. I think the moratorium is fine, uh, don't get me wrong. Um, uh, but um, uh, you can't just pass a problem from one party to the next. You can't say, we the, we the lessee are in real difficulty, therefore we're going to pass our whole problem to landlord. It's a shared problem. And that's why I think the, those of us in the, that operate the Tide model react very quickly to shared problem, and we both hit accordingly. Hmm. Yeah, there seems to be some examples in Europe, I think, of some tax relief on, on landlords to sort of, you know, release the pressure and then that could be passed on. The rateable value sort of issue with grants, so those initial grants, uh, you know, were only applicable if your rentable value was less than 51k across your businesses. Did, did that, you know, sort of, I'm just thinking if there's an approximate percentage, I think I read that 70% of hospitality businesses therefore didn't qualify, you know, for the grants in the early days. Would, would your position reflect that? Uh, yes, I mean certainly we we missed out on a lot of grants by fifty one thousand, and then you get into the state aid rules too. So there are, there are problems there, but they've been addressed in the second round, albeit the grant generous. So um, you know you can uh, get grants above the previous limit and now up to three million euros, uh, which is very welcome. And there's something prior that's above fifty one thousand, but it does slightly stick in the crawl to me that um, you know devolved administrations Most are giving higher levels of grant. I believe Scotland is now giving twenty five thousand, uh, whereas in the UK or in England it's uh, it's nine thousand maximum. So um, you know the total grants that we've received for our pubs covers about uh, uh, two weeks of our cost base. Um, which is clearly inadequate compensation for the, the fact that the industry has been singled out for special measures under Tier 3 and the previous iterations compared to other retail sectors. Um, so it is a big problem. I mean, going forward, though, the, the, we, we obviously, if we're not going to open till April or May, we clearly need uh, more grants emergency grants in that period. But going forward, the thing that will really make a difference is to cancel business rates and to hold VAT at the current level uh, for a further year. And I think the industry is unanimous in that ask because that is the way to allow people to expand margins whilst capacity is reduced or demand is lower uh, and therefore restore our respective uh, balance sheets and, uh, and, and start investing again. Mm. We're all hemorrhaging cash on a, on a sort of daily basis. We're all paying into the uh, the sort of furlough scheme with the need to pay NI and, and pensions. So, um, why do you think the government are taking so long? It seems clear that you know, particularly at the moment, we, you know, if we're not going to open, and the, the latest sort of reports are May, you know, there's probably a significant chunk of our teams that if we're not going to need them for the next three or four months, we would be better off, you know, laying them off from a financial perspective than contributing as we are at the moment. The, the rates and the VAT would give that glimmer of hope if you knew you could trade for really good. Summer. But the government seemed very reluctant to commit to that. It goes back to that sort of short-term solution rather than you know, allowing us to plough ahead. Why do you think that they're dragging their feet on that? Um, I sympathise that. I'm optimistic that, that that will be the outcome. But I think we're going to do it or announce it on March the 3rd as part of a budget re reboot the economy. And that would just be one of a number of measures uh, which will also benefit the tourism economy, etc. Um, I sincerely hope that the government doesn't go in the opposite direction and start raising this very quickly, um, because that will undoubtedly kill off any sense of recovery. So I, what, I'm, what I'm hoping is that there is a really exciting um, economic uh, resurgence that we can all look forward to that's announced in the budget and that we start to get an exit plan pretty quickly from mid-February onwards and a clear date that we can work to. That will mean that we hold our staff and it means we start properly preparing uh, for a big reopening with the vaccination programme goes according to plan could lead to an outburst of joy and 
and uh, 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 and uh, sort of a thrilling summer as people reconnect with each other. Yeah, no, I, let, let, let's hope so. Um, so last couple of points, uh, conscious that this has become, you know, a, a tiny issue compared to the pandemic, which is uh, interesting. But uh, very briefly on Brexit, do you, do you export much of what you produce? And, and have you had any experience in the last few weeks of, of the changes that have been put in place if you do? Yeah, we export about 10% of our volume. And uh, there was a little bit of stockpiling before um, Brexit. And here we are in Kent, you know, with um, all of the sort of challenges of the ports, etc. But if I'm honest, so far, it's been a, a bit of a non event. Um, there are issues as an exporter where we have to move to different labels, because certain products like our organic Whitstable Bay, which just too complicated to export. We had a nice little market in Sweden there. Um, so we've to pull that product. Uh, other products where, or other challenges with the supply chain where you need to use EU type pallets. Um, so in the warehouse, parts of the supply chain, uh, there's added compl- complexity and cost. Um, there's more paperwork, more administration. But you know what? None of this is insurmountable. Um, uh, it's nowhere near as we bad as we had feared. Um, so far, the ports are re- running quite smoothly. I, they will become clogged up a bit towards January into early February, um, and it'll take a bit of time for people to get on the admin and the paperwork. But it is manageable. This and it's nowhere near as bad as it could have been under a no deal scenario where it would have been. Uh, uh, it, it extremely congested in this part of Kent and very problematic for all, but not just our own. Yeah, perfect. Okay, well, that's good to hear because, you know, it's always better to speak to somebody sort of on the coal face. So being, as you say, both in Kent, but actually exporting, uh, be great to hear if if, yeah, if it's not insurmountable and we can build it up over time, that would be great. Uh, so finally, you, you know, you sound like you're still pretty optimistic with those sort of thoughts of a, of a post-pandemic bounce, I guess, and maybe people wanting to get out and enjoy themselves after this. Uh, how are you feeling, you know, about this summer? And how long do you think it's going to take to sort of recover to a pre-pandemic level in, in terms of the business? Well, I, I'm very much in camp that, uh, of roaring 20s. Um, I think that people are fed up with being bossed around. I think they're fed up with having their liberty r- restricted. Um, they obviously have got you know personal fears we think will go with the vaccine. Uh, um, I think if we have a decent number and there is a return to live sport and music and events and parties and weddings, I think that there will be an outbursting of joy. I think people will return to offices, but it may take a year or so. Um, and I think the value of human experience and, and human interaction uh, has probably never been more valued. And the best place to do that is in the hospitality sector. Um, I think the counter to that is that the increasing authoritarianism from this government, other democracies, and the health lobby is exceedingly tasteful. And our liberty was surrendered um, to save the NHS. Uh, but we need to make sure that we 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 don't leave stuff on the table. So all of these restrictions be lifted immediately in one go, and not sort of argue. So let's keep table service. Let's keep this. Let's keep that. No, we gave it up the people, and we're not going to allow the health lobby or the government to steal it from us. So I think it's going to be battle head to retain our liberty, um, and I think. But fundamentally, humans need to meet face to face, and uh, that. And um, I, I'm I'm very optimistic that when that fear goes, um, we will um, we, we we will have a joyous few years. All it's the backdrop of a lot of global political and economic uncertainty. Yeah. But in our families and our friendship groups, it will be a good time. Good. All right. Well, that that feels like a suitably positive sort of rallying cry uh, to end on. So I will put links up to um, to the website and to your sort of social channels uh, in the show notes to this episode. But Jonathan, you know, best of luck getting through it. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining me today. Really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Mark. Well done. If you got this far, you made it through the tech challenges that we had. My apologies once again. You'll be pleased to hear that I've purchased a few techie gizmos, so if the same problem does occur again, I reckon I can do a much better job. Always learning. And talking of investing in tech, don't forget you can help me in this department, particularly 
if you are a regular listener. I've decided thus far to keep the show free of any irritating sponsors, although I'm sure at some point the right partner will crop up. But for now, you can support the podcast, even with just a fiver, by hitting either the PayPal or Patreon button on the homepage of humansofhospitality.co.uk. It really means a lot to get your support. And whilst you are there, you can sign up for the weekly newsletter to make sure you don't miss a show. I only send one email a week, no sales bump, just some great info on that week's guest, with any links to their website, social media, or anything else of interest that may have come up in that week's conversation. Okay, that's it. I'll be back next Monday morning when, continuing the pub theme, we should have Lee Cash, founder of Peach Pubs, on the show. Have a great week. Cheers.